Hey there guys, today's topic is parliamentary sovereignty. It's a really popular topic in both courseworks and exams as an essay question. In particular, we're going to focus on to what extent can Parliament still be thought of as sovereign. Um, we'll cover the topic generally, but we'll try and keep that focus in mind. All right, let's get started. So the first thing that we need to do is consider the concept of sovereignty. And I think for this purpose, there are two types of sovereignty. The first of these is political sovereignty, which is being seen as held by the people, and legal sovereignty, which is the focus of this video, and this is being seen as held by Parliament, so parliamentary sovereignty. To give an example of the difference between the two, in the late 1980s, the Conservative Party introduced something called the poll tax, and they did this through an act of Parliament, so it was all perfectly legal. The problem was that the poll tax was incredibly unpopular, it led to violent protests on the street and was essentially unenforceable and the law eventually got repealed and the policy was abandoned and it did lead to the end of Margaret Thatcher's political career. And I think that what we can see from this is that while Parliament can pass laws, the ultimate final check on the elected body is by the people itself and this is something that we can bear in mind as we go through the video. Now, the best place to start with a definition of parliamentary sovereignty is the classical theorist A.V. Dicey, who gives three key definitions that we'll look at in detail. Firstly, Parliament can do whatever it likes in terms of the laws that it passes. Secondly, uh, a Parliament cannot be bound by its predecessor nor bind its successor. So the 2016 Parliament cannot have been bound by the 2015 Parliament and nor can it bind the future 2017 Parliament either. Thirdly, no one can question an act of Parliament in terms of its validity. So firstly, let's think about this unlimited lawmaking power. Sir Ivor Jennings famously said in a quote that Parliament could ban smoking on the streets of Paris and legally make a man into a woman. Now, obviously, this would be completely unenforceable, but the idea it comes back to the point that I've made firstly, that Parliament can legislate on literally anything it decides to. So in the Continental Shelf Act 1964, the UK defined its own borders. And in the War Damages Act 1965, Parliament made an act, an act that um, effectively worked retrospectively. So it applied to something that has happened in the past. Um, normally in legal terms, in terms of the rule of law, this wouldn't be allowed, but it just goes to show the sovereignty of Parliament. Um, now, obviously, this has to be balanced against political sovereignty. So Sir Lawrence Stevens once said that um, Parliament could legislate to kill all blue eyed babies. But obviously, like the poll tax, this would be unenforceable. And so we have to come back to this idea of political sovereignty. And Parliament can only really do something where the people would at least be accepting of it or tolerant of it. Secondly, Parliament cannot bind future Parliaments, and this leads us to the concept of implied repeal. So in Vauxhall Estates Limited and Liverpool Corporation, there was a contradiction between the 1919 Act and the 1925 Act of Parliament, and the courts decided that the 1925 Act should be the one that applies. So the later Act of Parliament is given precedent over the earlier one, and that's something that we can remember. But um, we'll look at a potential challenge to that concept of implied repeal later on when we look at EU law. Independence also has a factor as well about whether that could be repealed um, and whether that is acts as a binding on future parliaments. So the Statute of Westminster 1931 gave independence to a number of countries like South Africa. And the question was, well, would a future parliament really be able to um, stop South Africa from being independent? The idea being that once you've given South Africa that right, it cannot really be taken away. And this came up in the 1960s, 1970s, when Rhodesia independently declared uh, independence without an act of parliament from the UK. And this was questioned in the British courts. And the British courts did uphold the idea that um, Britain had sovereignty over Rhodesia or Zimbabwe, as it's known today. Um, but obviously, in terms of the reality on the ground, Rhodesia continued to act 
as its own independent country. And so that could be seen as the Rhodesian people exercising their own political sovereignty independent of the UK. The Act of Union with Ireland 1800 is another good example. This sought to bind Ireland to the United Kingdom for forever. But in 1949, the Ireland Act got passed and this recognised the independence of the Republic of Ireland. And so we can see there that the doctrine of implied repeal did work because the later act repealed the earlier act. Now, HLA Hart is um, a, another theorist and he has the idea that um, Parliament should be able to bind its successors because if it wasn't able to then it wouldn't really be seen as all powerful and this is an interesting concept um, and one that we'll come back to later. Thirdly, Acts of Parliament are unquestionable. Um, Lord Reid in Pickin has talked about this and said that while in the past it may have been seen that acts could be questioned, um, since the glorious revolution in 1688, as it's called, um, this is no longer really the case. But as we talked about earlier, there are other constraints. So Chief Justice Coke in Dr. Bonham's case talked about concepts of morality, whether there's a natural law or Christian principles, which this country is supposedly based on, whether that would act as a constraint on Parliament. We've also talked about political sovereignty, and so we can say that the electorate also act as a constraint on Parliament as well. Also, in the modern globalised world of the 21st century, we have to consider international relations. So, coming back to Jennings' quote about banning smoking on the streets of Paris, Parliament certainly could do that, but it would definitely damage international relations with France if it did. And so, they would choose probably choose not to on that basis. And finally, linked to international relations, we also have to consider the effect of European Union law, which we'll do in more detail now. So EU law um, is contrasted with parliamentary sovereignty because the case of Costa and ENEL from 1964 established the EU as a new and unique legal order, which should be seen as supreme over national law. Now, this seems to contradict with the idea of parliamentary sovereignty. And so there was a question for a while about how Parliament would really get round it. And the answer came through the European Communities Act 1972, in particular Section 2.1 and 2.4. 2.1 means that EU law is given effect in the UK. And Section 2.4 says that UK law is to be interpreted in line with EU law. So EU law is supreme in the UK. Um, but only because an act of parliament says it is. Now, this issue came to a head in Fact Attain number no. 2, 1991, um, and the Merchant Shipping Act 1988 contradicted the European Communities Act 1972, in particular a piece of EU law to do with fishing boats. Now, if we think back to the idea of implied repeal, we should say that the later 1988 Act should take precedent over the 1972 Act, and so the later Act should have effect. But in this case, the courts recognised the UK's international obligations under European Union law, and said that actually the European Communities Act should have effect over the Merchant Shipping Act 1988. And so what we see here is that the European Communities Act is almost seen as a special statute in a way, a statute with um, significant constitutional status, um, which contradicts earlier ideas that all acts of parliament should be equivalent. But we can see that in modern times, um, especially with the UK's international obligations, how this could be considered a little bit different. Now, finally, before we move on, we need to think about the different types of EU laws that are in place. Now, regulations are directly applicable, so as soon as the EU passes them, they automatically become part of UK law. And this could be seen as uh, diminishing the role of parliamentary sovereignty, because there's no role for parliament or any national government at this stage. So the EU passes something and it automatically becomes law um, and there's simply no place for Parliament whatsoever. <clears throat> 
directives are a little bit different in terms of uh, Parliament has to pass a law in order for them to become part of the UK legal system. But for those of you who study EU law, the case of Frankovic in Italy basically says that if a country such as the UK decides not to implement a directive, then it can be punished by the EU. And so we can see that even with directives where there is influence from national governments, um, there is still a check there um, which ensures the supremacy of EU law. Now, the idea I've put at the bottom there is the repeal of the European Communities Act 1972, and this would establish um, parliamentary sovereignty once again. Remember, I said at the start that um, the EU law is only supreme because it is said so, said to be so by an act of parliament. So if that act of parliament was repealed, then European Union law would no longer be supreme. So the argument therefore could be that parliamentary sovereignty is retained um, because the European Communities Act 1972 could be repealed by parliament. Now let's go on and consider the role of parliamentary sovereignty in relation to human rights and obviously the main piece of legislation we're going to consider here is the Human Rights Act 1998. In particular two sections. Section 3 says that primary legislation needs to be interpreted in so far as it is possible to do so in a way that is compatible with convention rights and this could be seen as a limitation on parliamentary sovereignty because the courts will always try and interpret acts of parliament in a way that is consistent with the UK's international obligations under the convention. However, um, this isn't quite the case and section 4 allows for declarations of incompatibility. So where an act of parliament does contradict the Human Rights Act 1998, as we saw with the Merchant Shipping Act and EU law, not quite the same thing would happen. The courts in such an instant would m simply make a declaration of incompatibility. So they wouldn't overrule the law as they overruled the Merchant Shipping Act. Instead, they would issue a declaration of incompatibility and it would be up to Parliament to do something about it. So in theory, Parliament could legislate against human rights. Um, and this was an issue that came up in Sims. And it was said that parliamentary sovereignty means that Parliament can choose to legislate against human rights, as we've said. Um, but this principle um, must uh, con be contrasted against the idea of um, political sovereignty and the idea that it would be repugnant to uh, legislate against human rights. And so this is a, of a balancing act that they have to consider. But we can at least see that um, while the Human Rights Act 1998 is of constitutional significance, it's perhaps not of the same level of significance as the European Communities Act 1972. So before we finish, there's some other considerations to make as well. So devolution, there were three 1998 acts that established parliaments within the UK. So we, we had the Northern Ireland Act, which established the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Government of Wales Act, which established the Welsh Assembly, and the Scotland Act, which established the Scottish Parliament. And the question really is, well, do these devolved institutions um, negate the idea of parliamentary sovereignty and in some ways you could say yes because in particular the Scottish Parliament has a lot of power but on the other hand the Parla UK Parliament could easily repeal the Scotland Act 1998 and be done with uh, that as an institution. Now, whether it would do so, um, because it would obviously create a backlash from the Scottish Parliament and also the Scottish people is another question. But in theory, at least, Parliament does retain its sovereignty in this way. Referendums are also another issue that you might want to consider in your answer. Um, referendums are technically um, the ultimate asking of political sovereignty. The electorate itself decides a particular issue. Um, uh, but the result of a referendum is only 
binding in a moral sense. So Parliament should reply to the referendum by responding directly to the will of the people. But the idea of political sovereign, uh, legal sovereignty with Parliament is retained because Parliament would still have to react to the referendum with an act of Parliament. Also, international treaties in a lot of countries such as America and Germany, once the head of state signs a treaty, that's it, it's automatically part of law. But in the UK, treaties have to be incorporated as part of the UK constitution um, through an act of parliament. There we have it. But what about our original question? Is parliament still sovereign? Well, Parliament has certainly given up a lot of its sovereignty in recent times through the European Communities Act 1972 and the Scotland Act 1998. But at the same time, Parliament could quite easily take that sovereignty back by repealing those Acts of Parliament. Now, whether it would do so is another question because we have to consider some of the less tangible factors such as political reality, the will of the electorate, international relations as well as Parliament's own moral duty to do the right thing. Um, thank you very much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Any questions or comments I do really appreciate them and um, so leave those below as well and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks again for watching. Bye!